This is Land of Favola, Acts chapter 4. Peter and John healed a lame man at the temple, which would have been no problem except that they healed him in the name of Jesus and openly preached Jesus. It was downright offensive to the rulers that he said Jesus was righteous and approved by God because they had just killed him. Furthermore, Peter said Jesus was raised from the dead and sitting at the right hand of God and would return. And he said Jesus was the prophet Moses predicted. And he said all the prophets from Samuel on preached Jesus in some form. So naturally, as Peter and John were preaching all this to the assembled crowd, verse 1, as they spoke to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came to them, being upset because they taught the people and proclaimed in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was now evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Comment, the number of believing men was about 3,000 at last count, now it's about 5,000. Peter and John spent the night in custody in verse 3, now verse 5. In the morning their rulers, elders, and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and as many as were relatives of the high priest. Comment, Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests at one time or other and took leading roles in killing Jesus. Their relative Alexander later became high priest as well. NET translation notes, verse 7. When they had stood Peter and John in the middle of them, they inquired, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we are examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, in him does this man stand here before you whole. Comment, Jesus told the disciples ahead of time, quote, when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, and the authorities, don't be anxious how or what you will answer or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that same hour what you must say, Luke 12, 12. So hopefully Peter and John had a restful night in custody and didn't overthink it. And sure enough, when it came time for trial in verse 8, Peter spoke being, quote, filled with the Holy Spirit, end quote. In verse 7, the ruler stood Peter and, Peter and John in the middle of them, and coming later in verse 14, the healed man was there in the middle with them. When Peter started his defense in verse 9, he pointed out the absurdity that they were on trial for doing a good deed. The healed man was there for the crime of being healed and happy about it. This is typical of the Holy Spirit. Anytime there's something wrong, he points out the absurdity of it to anyone who will listen. In verse 10, the Holy Spirit has transformed Peter. When Jesus was under arrest, Peter denied him three times. But now that Peter's been filled with the Holy Spirit, he says to the rulers, quote, Be it known to you all that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, in him does this man stand before you whole, end quote. He couldn't string together more offensive words in one sentence if he tried. Going on, the Holy Spirit says, Furthermore, through Peter, verse 11, He's the stone which was regarded as worthless by you, the builders, which has become the head of the corner. There is salvation in none other, for neither is there any other name under heaven that is given among men by which we must be saved. Comment, the stone in verse 11 comes from Psalm 118, 22 and Isaiah 28, 16. Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the prophecies of the stone were prophecies of himself, that he would be rejected but go on to become the foundation of what God was doing. When a craftsman lays brick, stone, or tile, the first one laid determines the position of all the others. If we want to line up with God, we must line up with Jesus. He's the cornerstone on which God is building and orienting and initiating everything he's doing. In verse 12, there's salvation in none other than Jesus. Verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and had perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Seeing the man who was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Comment in verse 13, Peter and John were, quote, unlearned and ignorant, end quote, in the sense that they weren't educated in the classical sense. But they were supremely educated in the sense that they spent three years with Jesus, 
but that didn't really teach them as much as what the Holy Spirit's teaching them now. Your narrator remembers a minister of a particular denomination declaring that his denomination placed a high priority on its ministers being highly educated. Many denominations do. And certainly God used highly educated men in the Bible such as Moses and Paul. We can assume many others of the prophets of the Old Testament were highly educated if they were from the priesthood. But God also used many without formal higher education, including Jesus, John 7, 15, and Matthew 13, 54 to 56. We miss the mark if we don't listen to the uneducated. Coming up, the Jewish council will put Peter, John, and the healed man outside to discuss the situation, verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? because indeed a notable miracle has been done through them, as can be plainly seen by all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so that this spreads no further among the people, let's threaten them that from now on they don't speak to anyone in this name. Comment, this is an overt act of evil. They couldn't deny the miracle, yet they didn't want the news of it to be spread any further, especially that it was done in the name, the name they didn't want to mention. We have to be on the alert of our own religious leadership today that they have the potential of denying the faith and to be unanimous in it. It's not so much in what they say, it's in the things they don't want to mention, in the things they never say. We need to find a place where the truth's being spoken in power, boldness, and fullness. Anything else is a, den a denial of the faith. Now calling Peter and John back in, verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, judge for yourselves. For we can't help telling the things which we saw and heard. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For everyone glorified God for that which was done. For the man on whom this miracle of healing was performed was more than forty years old. Comment, the man was in the age of decline, so they can't claim he's improving because of maturation. They commanded that Peter and John shouldn't speak in the name of Jesus anymore, and Peter and John said right away that they would obey God, not men. The council threatened them further, and verse 23, Being let go, they came to their own company and reported all that the chief priest and elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, O Lord, you are God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David said, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth take a stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your counsel foreordained to happen. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were gathered together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Comment, verse 24, as far as what the disciples would and would not preach, it didn't matter who the council were, it only mattered who the Lord God was, that he made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that is in them. In verses 25 and 26, David prophesied in Psalm 2 that the nations would rage, the people would plot a vain thing, and the kings of the earth would take a stand, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, the anointed being Jesus and his followers. They would say, let's break their bonds apart and cast their cords from us, meaning let's rid ourselves of the constraining effect of Jesus and his believers. We don't want to be constrained. At this, he who sits in the heavens will laugh, hold them in derision, speak to them in anger, and terrify them in his wrath. In verses 27 and 28, that prophecy in Psalm 2 held true when Jews and Gentiles and their rulers gathered together to kill Jesus. The prophecy will keep holding true until Jesus returns, that the powers of the world will generally reject Jesus and persecute his followers. They want to rule. 
They're obsessed with throwing Christ off. They don't want Christ to rule. So the point of them bringing Psalm 2 in, into their prayer was that they recognized there was a rage against Jesus that killed him, and now there's a rage against Peter and John for preaching him, as there was a rage, a rage against God ever since the earliest days of man, and there will continue to be a rage against him and his anointed against Jesus and his followers to the end of time. The rage of Psalm 2 will always apply until Jesus establishes peace. The spirit of Antichrist will always be in the world until then. In verses 29 to 31 in the prayer, Lord, look at their threats and grant that we may speak ever boldly in your name and that you would back us up, not necessarily by protecting us, but by granting even more healings and signs in your name. The prayer was right on the mark because the place shook in verse 31. Coming up, the believers were still marvelously unified. This is what Jesus prayed, quote, that they may be one, John 17, 21, verse 32. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed that anything of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was on them all. For neither was there any among them who lacked, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to each according as any one had need. Joses, who by the apostles was also called Barnabas, which is being interpreted son of encouragement, a Levite, a man of Cyprus by race, having a field, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Comment in verse 34, the apostles continued to give their testimony of the resurrection. The resurrection is central because had Jesus not been resurrected, it would have been the world's opinion versus his. But because of the resurrection, it's his opinion over the world's. God raised other men such as Lazarus, but the reason it's not equivalent to Jesus' resurrection is that Lazarus was raised by Jesus. When God raised Jesus, he was ratifying what Jesus said, such as that he was the great I am, John 8, 58, the Son of God, Luke 22, 70, and that Jesus would return in judgment, Matthew 25, 31 to 36. In verse 34, there's a time for everything under the sun. It used to be a time to buy fields and houses, and now it's a time to sell them and lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet for distributing to those who had need. In verses 36 and 37, the introduction of Barnabas. His real name was Joses, J-O-S-E-S, -E but the apostles called him son of encouragement, which is Barnabas in their language. He must have been enthusiastic. He was a Levite, which is a Jew from the tribe of Levi, and of Cyprus by race, also translated native of Cyprus. Cyprus is a large island in the Mediterranean about 75 miles off the coast. In chapter 13 of this book, Barnabas and Paul will go on a missionary trip, first stop Cyprus. Acts 5 is next.